hospital port is pride and dignity. Stop the new world order. Welcome to Hapanwo TV. And I've gone dark straight away. The lights are going out, the curtains are parting. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm on my way to the cinema. I'm going to the actual cinema for the first time since... When was it I saw Eyes Wide Shut? February. Yeah, the last roving review I did was Eyes Wide Shut. Um, I'm going back there. I'm going down this little alleyway and it's covered in thorns. So I'm going to squeeze past these thorns. So if I get distracted, that's just because I'm trying to get spiked by thorns. There might be some blackberries along here, which is nice. <coughs> yeah, and the, uh, the local view cinema here in Oxford has reopened. They're reopening them in phases. There's some more opening on the 21st of August, um, which is very welcome indeed. I mean, there's going to be all kinds of restrictions. Just, it was similar to being on the coach, I'm going to have to wear a mask. It's socially distanced seating, things like that. Um, I hope I, it didn't say on the website I couldn't pay with cash. I want to buy a ticket with cash on the door at the box office. Um, they didn't say you couldn't just go to the box office and buy some tickets. Um, so I'm going to go along and hope for the best. <laughs> uh, socially distanced seating means that the cinema is at reduced capacity because everyone has to sort of sit one seat apart or something. Um, which means they're likely to, you know, showings are likely to sell out quite quickly. However, this is this is a weekday matinee, so it's unlikely to to be at capacity. If it is, obviously, I'll have to come back another day. I'm just pleased to be going to the cinema. <coughs> I'm just pleased to be going. Um, when the lockdown started, people were predicting the end of cinema. I remember they were just saying, "Oh, I don't think cinemas are ever going to reopen now. People are just going to stay at home and watch Netflix." But that hasn't happened. I mean, I thought that wouldn't happen because. For reasons I've stated in other films, um, in other videos where I talk about this, roving reviews of films, um, there's something special about the cinema. It's like a, it's a, it's an occasion. You go in, you sit in this big room with big screens, the big velvet seats, and there's hundreds of other people in there you're sharing the experience with. It's, it's, um, you know, there was this film, there was this documentary about cinema once where a guy said, you know, you can't get all that condensed to a small box in the corner of your room. Don't you want to dream anymore, he said. Um, you, you can't. I mean, this is the point. And people are predicting the end of cinema ever since the invention of the television. Hasn't happened. Probably will never happen, I'm glad to say. So I'm going to go and see a film. Now, what film am I going to see? Well, you may have noticed that I've... Although I check out new releases, and I've been watching new releases, <coughs> and that's primarily what reviews are for, I have been watching several... Oh, look, that's a good idea. Mmm, yummy, yummy. Mmm, mmm. Excuse me a moment. Mmm, mmm. Thank you very much, Mother Nature. Mmm. Mmm. Well, that one's a bit sour. Um. Um. Although I've obviously check out the new releases. Um, I've been watching a couple of films which I've seen before. And some of them are quite old. I mean, obviously, I went to see It's a Wonderful Life at Christmas, if you remember. Which is a 1946 movie. Or 1946, yeah, I think it's 1946. And, um, or 47, I can't remember. And, um, I, I, it's one I know very well. I've watched it many times. But I wanted to see it on the big screen. Again, I went to see Eyes Wide Shut, 1999, Stanley Kubrick. Um, seen it loads of times, wanted to see it on the big screen. Which is why I went to see it. And... This film I'm going to see now is different. It's one I have seen before on the big screen. <clears throat> yeah. Um, it's Star Wars Episode Five: The Empire Strikes Back. It's actually the 40th anniversary of its release, so they're doing like a, a special screenings of it. So um, that's what I'm going. That's what I'm, that's where I'm heading now. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so. Um, Again, this, this is, uh, you may wonder why am I going to do that. This is a film, I mean, unlike, for example, Dr. Strangelove, which is a film I saw when I was a small child and had, on the television, hadn't seen since. Didn't really remember when I went in to see it with Mark Devlin last year and saw it on the big screen. Um, this is different. Uh, Empire Strikes Back I've seen many times since its first release when I saw it on the cinema. I've seen it many times... I've actually got the DVD of it at home, and I've watched it many times. So, why am I going to see it on the big screen? Why am I bothering? Because, as I've explained, watching a film in the cinema is a different experience to seeing it on the TV at home. 
it is different and it gives you a new angle on it you see it from a different perspective than you would if you watched it at home and I have found <coughs> by doing this I found this by watching It's a Wonderful Life in the cinema by and watching Eyes Wide Shut in the cinema I found that these very familiar films to me took on a new perspective I noticed things about them I hadn't noticed before I appreciated them in ways I hadn't appreciated them before in fact my enjoyment of the films before and since and I've watched I've actually watched It's a Wonderful Life since we've seen it in the cinema. My enjoyment of those films has been enhanced, even when I watch them at home now, by going to see them on the big screen. It's part of the magic of cinema, which is why I think cinema will never go away. And so I'm going to go and see it with this film now. The Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, now I remember when I went and saw it actually, I'm just going to get me, I made a few notes here. Um, this, of course, is the uh, from the original Star Wars trilogy. It's the middle film of the trilogy. Now, middle middle sections of trilogies are often they're often considered they're almost seen as bridging between the beginnings and endings of things. I mean, I suppose there's an element of this with uh, Roswell Revealed. Um, although, I mean, I don't consider Roswell Revealed just a kind of bridge. The Roswell Revealed is a story in its own right, as you know if you've read it. <coughs> but of course, it it starts as a the beginning of Roswell Revealed leads on from another story, and of course it doesn't complete. It ends with essentially the opening to a new story. Although I didn't actually make the decision to write the third part, Roswell Redeemed, until quite late in the writing of Re Revealed. Um, Empire Strikes Back is, is like that in a way. What's, it's different from the others. Firstly, it's not directed by George Lucas. It was, oh, what's his name? I can't remember the name of the play director. Um, I'll look, it'll, obviously, it'll, I'll look, it'll be in the description box and I'll, I'll bring it up later, obviously, but um, it had a different director. What, what it was, Lucas was doing something else at the time. He didn't have time to direct the film himself, but he, I know he, he got some trusted collaborators in to, to do it, to do the direction and the writing and the production design, things like that, which means it is, it is very... It is very George Lucas. I think they were just trying to emulate George Lucas's style. I think this may have been part of the contract or something. I don't know, but um, <coughs> it's a, it's a um, it's different from the other Star Wars films. I mean, obviously, the, the the original Star Wars trilogy is, as far as I'm concerned, the only real Star Wars. I mean, the prequel trilogy, well, I enjoyed. They were okay. Um, they're not bad, but they're not the same. Even though they were directed by George Lucas, they came out many years later and they they were different um the well the, the new trilogy uh, well i'm not going to go on a rant now but uh, i don't really even want to think or talk about those <laughs> but i have reviewed them on this channel so you'll see you'll have seen them and i did an article for the first one um but uh what i what you'll find is with, with the middle of a trilogy, like I said, this, this is in a sense a bridge between the beginning and end of the arc, the story arc of the Star Wars trilogy. It is, it does function as that. And what's more, it is, it's inconclusive. It opens, in a sense, even, it's even more, in a sense, open-ended and open-begun than Roswell revealed. Much more so, actually. <coughs> it begins with a, a, a young Luke Skywalker who's matured, he's a, th a few years older, active in the Rebel Alliance, hiding out from the, uh, the Empire, trying to hunt him down. Now, I don't, I'm not going to give you spoilers, I'll save those for the end, <laughs> but um, as I said, I'm very familiar with this film, but unlike the other Star unlike I think all the other Star Wars films, it doesn't end happily. It's a very tragic, and uh, well, not, not completely tragic, but it's a very sort of like it's very, it's almost anticlimactic actually, it's very lukewarm, the ending, and it is sad, I mean obviously the story is so open-ended you just know it's just going to carry on. In a sense it's almost, it always has to be continued on it. Because of course, <coughs> I'll tell you more about the story of course afterwards, but it is very much a point where you don't know how it's going to end, and what's more there's some a suspense element, there's no indication at the end of of episode five that it's gonna it's gonna things are gonna get any better we, we are left with basically a lost Han Solo 
as I said, spoilers later, we have a Luke Skywalker who's injured tra and traumatised by, well, the paternity bombshell. That's not a, really a, that's not exactly a spoiler. I think everyone knows that now, don't they? But, um, and of course the, the title, The Empire Strikes Back, is what actually happens. So the, the titles of these films tend to give away the, the plot, in which like Return of the Jedi and The Empire Strikes Back. They, they give away the plot, they give away the ending. And of course the Empire does strike back, that's the point. <coughs> and um, Well, as you know, we, we, I've seen it with retrospect, The Return of the Jedi, of course, they turn things around, but um, you don't know that at the end of this film, you don't know it. It's going under the railway bridge here. I mean, regular viewers will be familiar with this. You know where this, uh, this is the, oh, it's nice to be going back here, it really is. It's ages since I've been here. My last, what was the last one? I saw Eyes Wide Shut, it was, oh, it was the Ultimate Picture Palace, wasn't it? And then I saw, of course, uh, the other one, Eyes Wide. Both of them were at the Ultimate Picture Palace. So my last two roving reviews have been there. I'm going back tonight to go back to the view. I can't remember what the last film was I reviewed here. But, um, <coughs> The funny thing is, I mean, I've come round to thinking this way. I didn't before because my mind was a bit messed up by the by the new trilogy, and I wasn't thinking straight. But generally, among fans, this is the this is considered the best. It's considered the most popular, and it's um, despite its um, despite its lack of a kind of moral arc and a kind of vindication at the end, it's still considered by fans the best. And I think I agree. The best element of it, and I'll go into more detail at the end, is you you have this kind of Carlos Castaneda story. And I didn't realise that I didn't actually realise the link between or the, what I suspect is the link between the Carlos Castaneda books and this until much later when I read the Carlos Castaneda books. But you have the introduction of a character, an amazing character called Yoda. And um what the, the 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 act of the film in which Luke and Yoda first meet and interact is incredible. I'll say more about that later. <clears throat> so I'm going to go and watch the Empire Strikes Back on the big screen, not for the first time, but for the first time in a long time. In well, I don't want to say how old I am, but you know, I it's obvious I'm a mature kind of chap. Even though I'm quite a youthful person, I am mature in my years. And I remember when I went to see it the first time, I remember seeing The Empire Strikes Back in the cinema. Um, it was actually the Phoenix Cinema, the same one where I saw Doctor Strange, love. It was in 1980. I was, I wouldn't say how old, but I was a small child. And I got in for free because my mum worked there. And it was a double bill. They were showing, they were actually showing a double bill, beginning with Star Wars Episode Four, and then the new one, Empire Strikes Back. And there was a little break in between, and I got... I remember, I remember it very well, actually. It's funny things you remember from the past so long ago. I remember running around the corridors when I was a little kid, being stopped by one of the staff. And I said, oh, you're... you're and the game on mum's, and I your mum's, all right, you're, his, you're, you're her little boy, go on then. He wanted to see, what, wanted to see my ticket, and I said... I remember, I remember I had a strawberry sundae. One of those bloody lovely ice creams I've ever had. Ice cream, creamy, sort of fruity kind of cup thing. Strawberry Sunday. They used to specialise in them at the Phoenix. And I can still taste it now. The cherries and everything. I don't know, I wouldn't have probably guessed all those years ago as a little kid that 40 years later I'd be coming back to watch the same film film again. But uh, I'm curious. I'm curious to see what it's like. So uh, I think that's where I'm going to head next. I'm almost there now. I'm past the very sad site of the old pub where I met that strange guy Jack from Antarctica. Um, seems to be all gone now. Sad that. But anyway, I'm going to head in there, I think. But, uh, well, there's one more thing I've got to do before I go in. What do you think of my mask? It's my new one. Now, you'll have seen the one I wore to, to Truth Seekers Northeast, COVID-1984. I'm sticking with the Orwellian theme, theme with a couple of new masks. Now, uh, this one you'll have seen if you follow me on Facebook, because they did actually post it there. But I'm staying with the Orwellian theme. theme. Two plus two does not equal five. It's the freedom from which all other freedoms come. And it's, someone actually did ask me about it. And, you know, what's that mean? And I told them. That's what I hope will happen. You know, people actually ask me what it means. 
But uh, it's part of the rules now, you've got to wear one of these in the cinema. So, not to worry, not to worry, I should put up with it. Um, and of course, uh, you know, it gives me an opportunity to spread a bit of dissent. You know, um, this just struck me, one thing I hope, I've got a terrible feeling that this is going to be like, I'm going to see a film which is basically one of the, f one of the, oh God, well, the thing about the Star Wars, the original Star Wars trilogy, was that sometime in the, sometime in the 90s, just after the, or sometime in the early 2000s, just after the release of the prequel, George Lucas went back and started fiddling. He started fiddling with the, Illumin the uh, original trilogy. He started fiddling, putting in new sound effects, new special effects, uh, or uh, visual effects and things like that. He uh, added another scene that had originally been cut out um, with Jabba the Hutt and um, several other kind of new little additions and subtractions to the film. Um, and he wanted to improve on it because he said this is what I wanted to do but the technology wasn't around at the time. But, you know, if this... Oh, this, this sort of thing bugs me, and it bugs a lot of the fans too. I think the producers of, of, these, of, of these productions, I think they don't understand their fans, a lot of them. They don't realise how incredibly conservative and sentimental sci-fi fans are. I mean, I know Star Wars is not technically science fiction, it's a space opera. It's, it has science fiction elements, but it's not a science fiction film. But it is generally thought of as a science fiction sort of film. And it's like, you know, people are looking at some. No, no, we don't. We, it's it's fine as it is. Look, George, you created a masterpiece. Why are you going back and polishing it? The thing is, if you keep, if you make a sculpture or something, for example, you keep polishing it. You keep going back and polishing it and varnishing it and sanding it and polishing it and varnishing. It, you're gonna wear it away. You'll be left with a pile of sawdust. And so. The thing is, he did fiddle with Empire Strikes Back. He, all the original trilogy had some bits made. I mean, you, you, I mean it's almost a meme with Darth Vader. No! I, I, th I think that's actually Return of the Jedi he does that, not Empire Strikes Back. It's the one where he kills the Emperor. He goes, no! In this one, it's where Luke falls. I can't remember if he says a no! Where Luke falls down. After he's had his hand cut off. I don't know. But I hope, I really hope against all hope, that this is not some bloody effing sort of um, touched up kind of plasticified version. Just leave them as they are. <coughs> it's like there's a couple of experimental clips. Blake 7, right? Um, luckily I've got the DVDs of it already and it's in its original form, but you got you Google it on YouTube and there's a couple of I mean some keep some keeps uploading the old episodes bootleg anyway. And I'm not going to actually criticise them for that, simply because there's a couple of clips on there where they have new special effects for them. And I thought, you bastards! Blake 7 is famous for its, for its homespun special effects. And that's, what, that's one of the things we love about it. Give us back our spaceships on strings! So that's kind of my fear at the moment. That's, what, that's kind of what I'm afraid of. Anyway, we'll find out. We're, we're almost there now. There's the Oxford Stadium, the Kassam Stadium there. For Oxford United. Here's uh, this place I've not been to for so long. It's nice to be back, there's the bowling alley, there's uh, the other places along there, so anyway, see you later. Well, I'm out, that was fun. As always when I get out of the cinema, I have this big uh, look around me, my eyes do take time to adjust the light, although <coughs> not so much in this case. I mean, somebody left the lights on, I mean, I don't know. I suppose it was like, I thought the thought of thirst was intentional, it's probably one of the coronavirus rules. But uh, just before the end, someone came and did switch the lights off, but they left a light on in the, in the screen. Uh, which meant that some of, the, some of the scenes were hard to see, like the space scenes and things like that, because big light shining on the screen. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a shame, I should have asked my bloody money back. Not to worry, I was just... Uh, I'll probably I'll contact them online and I'll just say, oh look, you know, you should were well, you meant to leave the lights on or not? Because if so, that was a bloody swizz. But um nevertheless, you know, it's, it was nice to see that film again. It was nice it was nice to see this film. Um it was actually nice to get back in the cinema. It was nice it was only you know it was only five pounds or four ninety nine, you know, for that. That was that was actually very cheap. 
they've got all like saver rates on at the moment um, and also uh, the, I got in the VIP seats because the, the the price for the VIP seats is currently the same as the regular because of the social distancing measures but they may say make sure you sit in a seat which is your ticket says it is screen 9 row H number 12 that was me <laughs> but, um, <coughs> I had a Cornetto, I had a strawberry Cornetto, I haven't had one of those for years and that's always, I bought one of those and I could take my mask off to eat those apparently, they let you lower your mask to eat things they can't have um, people not buying their stuff but I always used to eat Cornettos when I went to the cinema when I was a kid I probably had one actually when I went to see this the first time 40 years ago and so I had another one, it was nice actually it was nice actually, um, unfortunately the um oh yeah one more thing yeah i uh i had to uh give my name and phone number but i gave a fake name and uh a fake number at least i think it was a f well i uh i sort of like read. i think i might have accidentally recited my old phone number but um, i didn't get my real name like i said i don't trust them I, you know i don't don't see why i should give out these details, I mean, they're just just to contact you if someone gets ill in the cinema. So they've got a nice big database with my name and phone number. At least they didn't ask for my full. Uh, if they'd asked for my, I actually had a fake address lined up just in case they asked me for my full address. Mm. Um, <coughs> no one. Um, the film, of course, I'm familiar with. The uh, it's unfortunately was the one which was fiddled with by George Lucas. I do sometimes wonder, and I mean, it had all, I mean, to be honest, some of the, some, in some of it, it actually does enhance the original. For example, the Cloud City scenes, where you actually have windows where there used to be none, and you actually see, see you know, outside, you see like uh, spaceships flying around outside the windows, and there's other buildings within the city. I mean, that, I suppose, does add something to it. <clears throat> but it seems, he just went overboard. And I think it may have been, I think possibly George Lucas felt dissatisfied with the prequels. I really think maybe he did. Because the prequels, you see, I, I actually enjoyed the prequels. I thought they were good films, but they were, they were lacklustre compared to the originals. I mean, the thing is when you, that's the problem, I think I've said this before, but it's the problem that uh, Slacks, uh, I think, brings up with Red Dwarf. Once you achieve greatness, your fans will expect nothing less from you. And anything less than greatness, anything less than complete greatness, will leave them disappointed. And they'll become, essentially it may turn your fans into perfectionists, and you have to become a perfectionist to match them. And so you have like a, this really a difficult situation where you are essentially continue. you have to be a kind of continuous ascendant, and of course Lucas couldn't do that after the original trilogy. I mean, the prequels were good. Uh, standalone movies, they were great, but everyone was watching them thinking, how does this compare to the original three? Because, I mean, everyone was, they were so anticipated. I mean, people used to, when the prequels were announced, when the first prequel was, came out, The Phantom Menace, the fans, Star Wars fans, used to dress up in Star Wars costumes, like the ones that I saw in, we saw in Hull. Um, and they used to go to the and get a ticket for the cinema and watch the movie just to see the trailers, let alone the actual films, just to watch the trailers. They dress up in costume to watch the trailers. And there was a slightly the response was tepid to those films. Some, pe some people actually really hated them. I didn't think I didn't hate them, I thought generally they were good, but. They fell short of the original. This might have caused Lucas to get a bit, go a bit nuts and start fiddling with the original trilogy. I don't know, maybe as a sort of subconscious act of revenge. But other examples are the right. This is a the the, the, the Hoth creature. Now, um, for those of you who uh, are familiar, and I'm not going to turn this into a big criticism of Lucas's fiddling. All right, but um, the film begins, of course, with the the Rebel Alliance are on the run. The Empire, after destroying the Death Star, the Empire has struck back, hence the title. Um, and they are pursuing them across the galaxy. And um, the Rebels sort of hide out in this little, this, this very cold planet with a very cold climate. It's called Hoth. 
Um, it's actually filmed in Norway. You know, uh, Hindu cowgirl, the train driver, she actually pointed it out where they filmed it on, on one of her journeys through, winter, through the winter scenes of Norway. Um, beautiful location. And, um, <coughs> and so the attack. Now, Luke is attacked by this creature called, it's called a Wampa. We found out later it's called a Wampa. W-I-M-P-A. And um, in the original, you don't see much of this creature. You just see it attack his beast. They also, they, the, the actual rebels are riding on these things called tauntauns, which are like two-legged creatures with horns, woolly, furry creatures with woolly fur because it's cold there. Go under the old bridge again. And, um, and it's attacked by this creature, this wampa thing. And you see, you don't see much of it, but that, in a sense, I mean, Lucas has put in this huge CGI, this, this CGI Wampa. It's very well done, actually. And you see it in every detail. You see Luke attacking it. He severs the arm of this creature. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's spoiled. You see, you, you shouldn't see too much of some things. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't see too much. You, a good storyteller knows what to tell the audience. But he also knows what not to tell them, what not to show them. This is why, you know, in the, in the new edition of Close Encounters, the third kind, Lucas, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Steven Spielberg, the director, he really fought the producers. I mean, to bring out the new edition, they said, no, we've got to have another scene where you see inside the flying saucer, the mothership. And uh, Lucas said, no, no, I don't want people to see inside that ship. I don't want people seeing inside the, the, the mothership. It's got to be left to the, the imagination of the viewer. That's part of the. That's part of this experience of seeing this film. You have to leave that in the m in mind of the viewer. And um, they insisted in the end we get this ridiculous scene, which luckily has now been cut out. I think um, Spielberg couldn't wait to to get rid of it. I think for the 25th anniversary edition. <coughs> but I'm uh, um, for a while they were like, you see this, you see aliens inside the spaceship and things like that. Um, and same with the Wampa. It's more scary when you see less of this creature, so you could imagine what it's like. You see this sort of like woolly, furry, white thing. Looks like a, a cross between a polar bear and a gorilla with big horns on its head, like the Tonton. Maybe it's a feature of the, the life forms of that planet. And, um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a thing. I mean, um, so that was a bit of fiddling we could have done without. What other, what other alterations did he make? Well, well the Boba Fett, the bounty hunter, is a... Uh, Boba Fett, the bounty hunter, he's, he's played by a different actor in this film as he is in the prequels now. And, and the prequels, of course, in the film, in the original film, he's, he's introduced in this film, in, the, in episode five, just trying to find... Han Solo to get him back for Jabba the Hutt, the big slug-like monster who Han, Han owes him a lot of money. And so basically he sent this bounty hunter after him who's collaborating with the Empire to get Han Solo. The only reason they want to get Han Solo is to lure Luke Skywalker, knowing, taking advantage of his compassion, as psychopaths do, to, uh, to get him to this place where they can trap him as well. Um, now, uh, in the... Uh, In, in the film, he's played by this particular actor who doesn't speak. There's no, he has no lines at all. He's completely silent. He wears this green body armor and helmet. Um, in the prequels, he's played by. Uh, in, in, the, well, in the prequels, um, I'll explain what it is because in this particular particular f bit of fiddling by George Lucas, they've given him lines and he has a voice. And he speaks with a strong New Zealand accent. He says, sir, he says, Vader says, Solo will be delivered to you alive, so long as you keep your part of the bargain. And then um, Boba Fett, who's silent and originally was silent, now turns to him and says, as you wish, he's no use to me, he's no use to me deed. So it's a strong New Zealand accent. Um, and of course, that's because in the prequels, Boba Fett is played by a New Zealand actor, Tamora Morrison. And you actually see him, you know, he takes his helmet off and you see his face. <sighs> and they bloody, so they've blind given him, they've given him, they made this man who's supposed to be silent, they made him speak. <sighs> it's very annoying, that. Again, that's, that's something you could have done without. 
Funny thing about accents, oh, if you notice this, it's actually mentioned on Wikipedia, the Star Wars in online information database. But uh, there seems to be a trend with with the kind of way that people speak, because of course they're in a galaxy far, far away. They're speaking this thing called Galactic Basic, which is whenever you hear someone speaking English in the film, that's what they're really speaking. But there's a, there was um, verbal. There are linguistic trends within Star Wars. For example, the rebels tend to have a North American accent, US or Canadian, and the uh, the Imperial, the Empire, the people of the Empire tend to uh, speak with English accents. <coughs> they had Michael Sherd playing the um, the leader of the bad guys, but of course they keep dying. I mean, this thing. This is the thing about the the Empire. They they have this guy called. Um, Admiral Ozzel. I remember. I remember the name so well because I read Alan Dean Foster's novelizations, which are really good, actually. They're bloody good. I tell you, what, it's almost as good as reading, watching the films, reading those novelizations by Alan Dean Foster. Um, Admiral Ozzel fails Lord Vader. Do not fail me again, Admiral. I, I won't. I won't, Lord Vader. He says because he does, and Vader kills him with the death grip to the, with the death grip on his throat, you know, the invisible claws around the throat. And then he makes uh, this other guy, this captain, Captain Piet. He makes him the admiral, and, and captain. He says, "Oh God, I've got a promotion." And he thinks, "Oh my God, what if that happens to me?" <laughs> of course, it does. And someone else comes along, and he's killed. And it's like, uh, uh, so this is this what you. That's what you do if you if you serve the the beast, the dark forces. You know, they don't. You, you don't get any kind of like reward they they use you for as long as they can and they get rid of you it's the alternate sort of like problem with the faustian bargain is the devil never keeps his side of the agreement indeed that happens again later on in the film um, <coughs> it was wonderful to see that great hospital porter peter mayhew again animating the furry body of chewbacca um, he was actually hired to the for the new trilogy because he he got ill when he got older and, he couldn't actually play Chewbacca himself after the uh, the first new f new film of the trilogy. So he went to he became he became Chewbacca advisor though to the new permanent Chewbacca advisor to the new actor playing him. So he would like coach the new actor playing Chewbacca how to play him. Chewbacca was this sort of big furry creature who. Uh, Looks really mean, and when I used to be, when I was a kid, I was scared of him. I was, I was really scared when I first, when I saw the first Star Wars when it first came out. I was scared of Chewbacca, but um, I, of course, he's not. He's lovely. He's got. A, he's a very sweet creature. He's strong as an ox, but like gentle as a very gentle natured. You know, um, which is fitting that he's a hospital porter. Inside him is a hospital porter. Um, Peter Mayhew was at, uh, he was at Guy's Hospital London, yeah. They had to get a special uniform made for him because he was too big for, for any of the others. Hmm. Um, there's a lot there's a lot of romance between Han and Leia, which is kind of a bit I don't know, it's a bit cheesy, it's not very good. Um, of course this is start this starts in the in the original film, A New Hope. When they first meet, it's obvious they're sort of like digging on each other, and, um, and Carrie Fisher actually very very good, very good actress. Um, sadly passed away. Part one of the 2016 club she was. Um, she was only 22 when she played Leia in um, in that film, Empire Strikes Back. She was 19 in A New Hope. She's clearly playing quite a sophisticated woman, probably a few years older than she is. Although it turns out later she and Luke are twin sisters, I think you first it's you see um, Han Han Solo, of course, is a little bit older than Luke. He's sort of like about ten years older. So uh, when it first starts, like Luke is twenty, Han's probably in his early thirties, and I get the feeling that Leia is about the same age. Turns out later that Luke and Leia are twin sisters. Anyway, there's a bit of I suppose there's a bit of a discrepancy there, but um, she really plays she really really plays Leia very well indeed. It was a bit cheap, actually, when they brought her back for the new trilogy in CGI form. I mean, they had the perfect opportunity to do away with her when she gets blown out of the ship's cabin. I mean, the ship's cockpit. Um, one of these, these big, funny for some reason I don't know, these big um, st 
star cruisers or whatever they are these giant spaceships space battleships they have like a they have the control center on the outside with big broad windows overlooking space so which makes them strangely vulnerable all you have to do is like break those windows and you destroy the command center um, which seems like a bit of a design flaw you'd probably if I was building those things I'd probably have the command center deep inside the spaceship so it would could survive even if the out exterior of the ship took a shot you know took damage but it doesn't look so cool I suppose it don't look so cool but anyway she gets in the original in the new trilogy as you know because I've, I've reported on it for this channel Leia gets blown out into space and then she uses the force to get back and then they have to bring her back up and then she dies then the actress dies and they have to think what were they going to do you know she actually died before that film was released it would be very easy to re-edit it so that she dies and just put in a new scene just explaining how Leia's gone and she doesn't really play any role you see in the she doesn't really play any role at all of any significance after that Apart from, of course, being Kylo Ren's mother and Han, of course, being his father. So their romance does, of course, develop into a, a marriage which eventually goes wrong. But by that time, they've had a child who's grown into this dark side person. Um, there's also, like, I suppose I'm getting a bit nitpicky here, but on the Hoth scene, they've got this big shield up around the planet. So the... They can't bombard it from space with bombs from space. So they send down these land transports, which in real life would be like some kind of tracked vehicle. Or even like, what about the anti-gravity ones they have in the prequel? I mean, do you remember? They have these like anti-gravity vehicles. They have anti-gravity as a technology in this universe. We know because at the end when, when Han Solo has been carted away after he's been encased in carbonite, he's on some kind of anti-gravity gurney what the Americans call I, mean, I much prefer that word actually to patient trolley um, so why do they have these at these attacks they call them walkers which are these large vehicles which are powered which are driven by artificial four artificial legs and they have these also they have these detachable um, structures at the front which move and, and the reason is of course so they resemble some kind of four-legged beast and they look like Oh, they look like an elephant or something, or or a buffalo. It makes them look more sinister. But of course, as a as a as, a, as an offensive weapon, it makes them very vulnerable. Indeed, the way they bring them down because they can't shoot these things because they they've got like uh, shielding. They've got armor, so they get uh, some ropes, some very strong rope, and they they take some cable and they tangle up the legs so they fall over. Hmm. They have these really neat, like these things called snow speeders, these very neat little aircraft that they use. I used to have a toy one of those when I was a kid, I remember. And, um, yeah. But then, of course, the rebels have to, they have to escape from Hoth because the Empire found them. Uh, but Luke, you see, when he's, he's, he's found in the end, he doesn't fall foul to the snow creature. And he's found by Han, Han Solo, and then he's taken to... But then he has this vision of... Obi-Wan Kenobi telling him this luckily hasn't been replaced by the bloody new one, they do have Alec Guinness thank goodness for that, that if, if they replace that Alec Guinness's force ghost with like the new, with like, what's his name that twat, that Scottish git oh, so I can't remember his name now there's a little Scottish twat who plays him um, if they replaced if they replaced the force ghost with with him I'd have walked out I mean, it's probably they wouldn't simply because Luke knows him as this. Luke knows him as the Alec Guinness's Obi Wan. That would be a step too far. I don't think. I don't think George Lucas would do that. <coughs> I mean, it's all up to Disney now because they own the franchise. It's up to them. They have complete control, thanks to Lucas selling it to them, which is something they probably regret. But they, he bought. Yeah, of course they bought out Lucasfilm for like so many billion. Lucas retires like a king, and but you know he's an artist. You know he loves his creations. He must regret it, considering what been what was done. Uh, but uh, anyway, they get away. Um, despite the fact the Millennium Falcon suffers numerous technical problems, it can't go into light speed the way it normally does. Um, they do all manage to get away. Luke as well, he gets away. And <coughs> it's, another, it's another little niggle I got, but... Um, 
the, the Millennium Falcon, it's, it's got C-3PO, Han Solo and Leia on. It shelters in a cave on an asteroid. To, so it escapes from the, the Imperial bombers who are trying to capture them. Um, and it turns out this cave is actually, is actually the, the cave is actually the body of a, some kind of gigantic serpent. Which then, when they realise what it's done, they have to fly out and they get out just before it shuts its mouth. And I thought to myself, how could such a creature have ever evolved? So I'm being really sceptical now, I'm being really sceptical, I'm being a bit of a sceptical, aren't I now? But how could such a creature ever evolve? I mean, it's a huge monster. And what does it eat? Spaceships. How often do they come along? Oh, every billion years or so. I mean, if that's all it gets to eat when you're waiting for a spaceship to come flying, the vastness of the universe, it has to wait until a spaceship's fly inside it. It's not gonna... It's not gonna be a very, very healthy being, is it? It's not gonna... It's not much of a sort of living. Unless... And I wish they'd gone in more, because there's these like, small creatures called Minox that live inside this big snake-like being. Uh, in a minute, we're gonna go past the house where I used to live. Um... Inside this big snake-like being, there's these creatures, these... Oh, well, actually, no, hang on, um... No, I'm on the wrong... Um, it's not... This, this is a different street, sorry. Called Minox. And they're the tiny little things, like bats. They're about three feet long. They've got these big suckers on them. Oh, I used to love this stuff when I was a kid. I really... I mean, it's... I can't enjoy the films the way I used to, these Star Wars movies, when I was a little kid. But there's something pure about them, and something... There's something fun and pure about the original trilogy, which I think appeals more to children than to adults. But as I say, I'm quite a youthful person at this point, being mature. <coughs> but you know, I ask these questions, you know, unless, unless, and I wish, as I said, I wish they'd explored this in more detail within the entire Star Wars universe, that there actually is a space ecology. Because, of course, this is something I've talked about before, you know, the space serpents. And Dr. Chandra Wickrama Singh and Fred Hoyle and their views about panspermia and how there's life in space itself. If they'd explored that in more detail, I, I think I would have been... And I found it more satisfactory. Or at least, if they, maybe they will one day, I mean, but... Because, I mean, we're told that space is just this dead, cold, empty vacuum and there's nothing out there. And these Earth is like a little oasis of life in an infinite cosmic desert. I mean, even those people who believe in, like, in alien life, like me. You know, a lot of us don't think, well, yeah, there are planets with life on, but space itself is just an empty vacuum. What if it's not? What if it's full of life? What if there are creatures out there? It's this, this fascinating concept has never really been developed in... in... I think fertile arenas where it could be, like the Star Wars universe. You know, the, the best depiction of this kind of thing was actually in Roald Dahl. Um, he wrote, I mean, he has, uh, I think, several of his books have science fiction elements, but one of the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator in particular have, and um, there's these space creatures called Vermicious Knids, Knids they're called, and they are exactly like space serpents. And we talk about they can actually fly in space. Their bodies can exist in the vacuum of space. I'm quite something. That's, would have been an interesting idea. And then Luke Skywalker goes to Dagobah. This is a planet which is like a great big kind of a swampy kind of place. You know, it's a kind of swamp that even Donald Trump couldn't drain. It's in not. It's like the whole covers the whole planet. And then he, um, and then uh, Luke lands his spaceship. He flies there in his spaceship, his X-wing class fighter, uh, just on his own. He's supposed to re real rendezvous with the other rebels, but instead he he just goes off to Dagobah to learn to get training from the Force from Yoda, this Jedi Master. Now, when when this uh, Kenobi said, tells him in this vision that he must go and train with Yoda, Yoda is the man who trained him was the one who trained him, although we, it's a different character in the prequels, it's partly Yoda and partly this other guy, but uh, played by Liam Neeson. But um, um, we don't know who Yoda is, we don't know anything about him. We just know he's called Yoda. And when, when Luke lands on this planet, 
he, well, he's, again, it's a bit incredulous, but he's lucky enough on the entire planet to land next to this creature, this wizened little sort of slightly reptilian being with a strange way of speaking. He's voiced by Frank Oz, the guy who does Kermit the Frog. Oh, help you, I will. Help you, I will. Yeah, and he's got these big, um, big floppy ears which go up and down, very expressive ears. And he makes a mess of himself. He tries to steal Luke's, Luke's food. He sort of, like, steals things from his... And he gets fed up with... Luke gets fed up with these very annoying little thing. And, and Luke goes, oh, I want to see Yoda. Get out of the way. Get out of the way, you creature. I want to see Yoda. And in the end, we find out that this is Yoda. And he's testing him. And, of course, that's how we are introduced to, I think, probably my favourite character of the entire Star Wars franchise. And the man, the guy, the creature, who plays this Carlos Castaneda role. And I'm sure Lucas must have read Carlos Castaneda before he made this film. Um, Carl, Carlos Castaneda is a writer who he wrote this uh, he wrote this series of books. There's the teachings of Don Juan, and then there's the uh, a bit noisy here. Sorry. There's the just going to over the road. Hmm. There's the teachings of Don Juan. There's the journey to Ixtlan, and then there's the a separate reality. And there's some sort of explanatory books afterwards, but it, it tells the story of a guy. I mean, people claim it's real, but well, some people say it's fake. <clears throat> but um, he tells the story of this Carlos Castaneda, is this guy who tracks down a um, a red Indian shaman and receives kind of tr instruction in the ways of the Native American shamans. Um, I've got to admit that the Carlos Castaneda character was, was partly my inspiration for Flying Buffalo in the Roswell trilogy. Not entirely, but partly. And um, it was only years later when I read those, I, I saw the film long before I read the books, but the books predate the film by about a decade, and they came out sort of in the 60s. Um, that I, I read the books years later and I thought, this is exactly like. This is exactly like Luke learning the ways of the Force from Yoda. It's really quite something. It's so... It's so like that. It's... and it's a, an amazing thing because, like, for example, um, there's Luke goes in... There's some that are very similar to Carlos Castaneda. For example, Luke goes into this cave he feels he has to go into this cave on Dagobah, this underground tunnel. And he goes in, he puts his lightsaber on, and <clears throat> he says, what will I find in there? And Yoda goes, only what you take with you. Yoda talks in this kind of mystical way. And then he says, your weapon, you will not need it. Oh, need, it will you, need it will you not. Yoda has this sort of way of, he has this strange word order that he speaks in. <laughs> need it you will not. It's almost like Welsh, actually, with the verb coming first. Need it you will not. Help you I will. Things like that. It's that kind of word order you find in Celtic languages, actually, where the verb precedes everything else. It's verb, object, subject. Verb, subject, object, rather. Um, but um, the get, getting back on topic, Luke, of course, goes into the cave and he has this vision of Darth Vader and he fights him. And it's, it's a really, it's a very powerful moment because it, it's all about... Luke's dilemma, Luke's choice, the, the forces that are tempting Luke away from his training because he killed in the dream, in his vision, he chops Vader's head off with a lightsaber but when, when that, then the, the helmet cracks open and he sees a vision of his own head, his own face under this mask. It's just so, <coughs> so, it's such a powerful metaphor for what's happening. And you see it again, actually, in, in Return of the Jedi, where it's, this takes it's his arm, because he looks, he cuts Vader's arm off, if you remember that. I'm, 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 it's not about that film, but it's the same thing. And then Luke realised he's got his own artificial arm, too. Um, but, uh, and of course it's, and it's explained better in the novelisation, but he, what it is, is uh, Luke takes his weapon in there. He takes his anger, he takes his rage, he takes the things that the dark side can use to seduce you. It's quicker, it's easier. Powerful is the dark side. Powerful it is. <coughs> Says Yoda. Do, give in to your hatred, do not. It's a lovely little park here. I'm going to sit here for a few minutes because I'm, I'm not far from where I live now. I'm just going to have a little seat where I live now. Sit on that bench. 
Oh, that's, uh... So this is this is the thing. Then, then, of course, there's the classic scene, the culmination of the training act on Dagobah, the whole act on Dagobah, Dagobah when Luke, um, when the spaceship sinks beneath the waters, and Luke tries to pull it out, and he, he there's only one of the wings sticking out, and he goes, "I'll try. I'll give it a try." And Yoda says, "No, no try. Do or do not. There is no try." So Luke goes like that, and he can't get it out, and it sinks even deeper. And then he says, it's a, you ask the impossible. It's too big, it's too heavy. And Luke says, oh, too big, too heavy, you say? Judge me by my side. Do you think we are, I can't remember the exact words, it's he's, he's so, he's so well done, so well voiced. And Yoda's just this puppet, of course, but there's so much expression in this, this, in this what is essentially a glove puppet. Yoda is actually, in the original movie, later on he's like a CGI figure in the... In the new trilogy, but in the in the original trilogy, he is a, a glove puppet, and um, he says, um, "Oh, judge me by my size." Of course, Yoda is tiny; he's a quarter of the size of Luke. Luke, we are not we are not these feeble, um, feeble, frail matter or flesh. He says, "Luminous beings, we are luminous beings of light." It's, like, it's an amazing scene, and he goes. And he lifts the spaceship out of the water and it arises. You look, you see him, there's an amazing shot actually, you see him doing like this. And above him are the, like the landing skids of the craft and um, it's dripping with, with seaweed, with waterweed and things like that. It's an amazing scene. And Luke says, I don't believe it. And Yoda says, that is why you fail. Absolutely classic, absolutely classic. Hmm. And then, of course, Luke has another vision. And this is this a thing, you see, because Han and Chewbacca are being tortured. And I'll just explain why in a minute, but basically, <coughs> Luke is. Luke picks up their pain in a vision and he has to go and save them. But Yoda says, Don't go, you'll, you'll ruin, you'll lose everything you do in your training. You'll lose. And then Ben, ben Obi Wan Kenobi appears and. They try to talk Luke out of going. You must complete your training or you'll sacrifice everything they fought for to defeat the Empire, to defeat the dark side. He says, I can't leave my friends. And then he says, look, I will return. He says, he's getting into a spaceship and he says, Yoda, I will return. I will complete my training, I promise. And Yoda goes, like, I've heard that before. I, he says, like, you can just see uh, in this glove puppet it has so much expression. Because Yoda's like saying, oh, I've heard that so many times from all the students I've taught over 800 years. He says, I'll come back, I'll complete my training, and they get they fall into the dark side, they get sucked in, they become Sith Lords. He's heard it all the many, many times. Ah. And so um, that's Luke's dilemma. I mean, he, he understands what he's risking, but, and then at the end, when they realise they can't let him go, they said, Don't give in to hate. Hate is the way to the dark side. Once you follow once you go down that path, there's no turning back, it will guide your path forever. What's happened to Luke and Han is they've gone to this place called Bespin, where Luke has this old friend, Lando Calrissian. And, um, it's a sort of like love-hate relationship, because apparently um, Calrissian, when he first greets him, calls him a no-good scoundrel, no-good swindler, and then embraces him and laughs, and realises they're still friends. But, see, Calrissian betrays them. Calrissian has done a, a deal with the Empire, because he lives on this cloud city, which is like mining gas. It has this pipe sucks it sucks gas up from lower levels of the atmosphere in this kind of gas giant so it's a, I suppose it's a gas giant isn't it um, like Jupiter and um, he mines that gas he compresses it and sends it all over the place and he's allowed independence he's the administrator of the city the Empire haven't taken it over and they say okay we'll leave you alone but you've got to play ball by us so Vader Darth Vader tricks him into capturing Han and Leia and Chewbacca torturing Han and Leia torturing Chewbacca and Han to get Luke to put that disturbance out in the force so that Luke will come will walk into the trap and at the same time of course Boba Fett wants Han and has done a deal to get Han to, to Jabba the Hutt which of course sets up the scenario for Return of the Jedi but um, Luke in the end decides to go and help them and walks into the trap whilst Han Solo is encased in carbonite he's deep frozen into this stasis state state in this kind of like 
he looks like comes on a waxwork statue, it's like that, and it's waxwork covering. Oh, and then there's this very poignant scene where he says goodbye to Leia, and she says, I love you, and he says, I know. And, um, of course, Lando's not really bad. I mean, he's a bit, you know there's something odd with him. He's, something, he's a bit sleazy, he's a bit creepy, and you know he's keeping some kind of secret, and of course, which he is. He is like, uh, he's like messing around with. He's doing oh, something, he's coming. Um, he's playing some kind of trick. He's playing, he's, you know, he's, he's up to something. He's up to no good. You know it. And of course, it turns out later what he's done. He's done a deal with Darth Vader, saying, look, I'll deliver these people. If you leave me alone, leave me an, an independent to run my city independently. And of course, Vader changes the conditions of the deal, as bad guys do. Again, it's, a, it's another Faustian bargain, isn't it? It's another, you do a deal with the devil, but then the devil wants his due, and the devil, you don't expect the devil to keep his side of the bargain. And um, then that's when he turns, he, um, he, he decides to help undo the evil that he's done. Um, Lando Calrissian, now he, appears in, he appears all through the tr trilogy, and indeed he appears in the, the new trilogy as well, as an old, obviously an older man. He's played by Billy Dee Williams, who is a black man. Yeah. And, of course, this is, this, I think this is the political correctness element, which really signifies the difference between the original trilogy and then the new one and the new Star Wars trilogy which shows how much times have changed how different things are today I can take a walk actually there's some people in here don't look, look like they're gonna be disturbing I mean it's um the culture has utterly transformed in the 40 years since the first trilogy was made and now these trilogies are made totally totally different um, Billy D. Billy D. Williams is absolutely brilliant as Lando Calrissian. The way he is this kind of like man of two faces. He's this two-faced individual. You see straight away, even when he greets Han Solo, he starts off hostile, then turns friendly almost instantly. In the very first scene where they meet and where he is, enters the film. And then this course exacerbates into the double dealing he does, which he then goes back on and becomes good again. <clears throat> and once he turns good, he learns his lesson. He never tries to help the Empire again. The fact that he is black is almost irrelevant. It's virtually irrelevant. I mean, he, the, the actor is black, but of course we're dealing with creatures who... I mean, they're called humans, men, women. They obviously look human, but they're not human. These are aliens. These are beings that live lived a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. They look like us, coincidentally. What colour would aliens be? You see, it's... it's so it's, it's pretty irrelevant in terms of the, the canon of the Star Wars universe. But, I mean, you, you just know, though, when you look at Billy Dee Williams playing Lando Calrissian, that he got... you, you can tell by the fact that... just by the, the, the respectful way he appears on camera, the, the dignified manner in which he appears on camera, that he is simply an actor doing the role. He's won that role through merit, the fact that he, was, he shined out at the audition and they decided to use him. You compare that to John Boyega in the new trilogy, he is basically the diversity hire. The token, as Sargon, as Sargon of a cad calls him. And, you just, and the thing is, when you, bring, when you bring a cast member in for that reason, it comes out in the, the stylistically in the film, and it ruins it. It ruins the film. I, I think I actually mentioned this in my review of the. I think I've, rev I've reviewed all th three films of the new trilogy. Two of them, the, the two most recent, the two second, third one on Hapano TV, the first one on Hapano Voice. It ruins it <coughs> um, for the reasons we've been into the, like, for reasons we've talked about before, cultural Marxism. You know, get woke, go go broke kind of thing. Um, it just goes to show that, you know, um, black people, black Americans, African Americans, whatever you want to call them, are perfectly capable of 
doing these things without affirmative action, positive discrimination, anti-white bigotry to boost them up. And when that affirmative action, that anti-white narrative and that bigotry is put in, it, it ruins, it, it destroys, it, it, it poisons everything. It poisons what was, used to be a wonderful film franchise, a magnificent universe of possibilities and an intrigue and excitement. So I think that's the lesson of seeing Billy D. Williams in The Empire Strikes Back. Ah, so, uh, of course, what happens next is, um, is very, the, the final scene is very well done indeed. Um, Irving Kushner actually is the director. Um, Irvin, Irvin Kirshner, sorry, he's the director. George Lucas is executive producer and producer. He uh, didn't write the script, he hired people to write the script and direct, but it is a, like a very George Lucas-like film. Like I said, I, only, I didn't even realise, actually, that it wasn't Lucas who directed this one. <coughs> um, a, of course, the, the point is that they have to... Tr they want to trap Luke Skywalker because they want to put him in Carbonite too, take him to the Emperor and turn him into a Sith Lord to make him send him over to the dark side of the Force. That's the point of it. Um, and of course, Darth Vader has got everything set up and he lures Luke into a trap. But Luke turns out to be more of a fighter than he thought. He fights back against Vader. And in the end... Sorry, funny. And in the end, of course, there's that remarkable moment, the paternity bombshell. Because you have someone referred to as Anakin Skywalker. I mean, Anakin Skywalker is the individual who's actually Luke's father, who never... You, know, you, you assume he's dead. Because in, in, the, in the first film, Obi-Wan tells Luke that Darth Vader betrayed his father. Betrayed him and murdered him. Anakin Skywalker is dead, but yet, and then you have like Anakin Skywalker. Refer, Anakin is referred to in the Empire Strikes Back when the Emperor, the Emperor appears. He'll be useful. I said, this son of Anakin Skywalker. You know, um, again, this sort of like sinister English accent that Americans love bad guys to have. <coughs> um, but of course, Darth Vader is Anakin. And Luke, he cuts Luke's hand off and then Luke falls. Well, he essentially can, tries to commit suicide. And um, he says, why didn't you tell me, Ben? Why didn't you tell me? Why did Ben, why did Ben lie? I mean, you find out later on what it's all about. But that paternity bombshell is one of, the, it's probably the greatest moment in the entire Star Wars franchise. Unforgettable. Absolutely unforgettable. I mean, I even, it went through my head for a while. Is he lying? Is he, is he lying? But then, in Alan Dean Foster's novelization, it's, um, it's like, like, like Yoda, Luke could sense the truth behind the words. Hmm. So I'm, I'm glad I saw it, even though the light shining on the screen did spoil it a little bit. I'll see if I can get my money back for that. Because... In fact, I mean, I hope they don't... I think they're going to watch The Matrix and re reviewing that because they're doing like a 20th anniversary edition for that coming up soon. I was thinking of doing a roving review for that, but I mean, it's a filmy noir, isn't it? So if they uh, leave the light on for that, it'll spoil it completely. It's almost all in the dark. Um, but, yeah, it's still... I'm glad I saw it. I'm glad... I mean, I remember it so well, it wasn't really a, a big deal. It's not like it's a new film I've not seen before. I've seen it numerous times. But I've not seen it for about five years, probably. It's quite good to see it again. For the second time in my life, in, on the big screen. Forty years later, I come back and I watch it on the big screen again. It's great, actually, cinemas are showing these old movies, like Doctor Strange Love and It's a Wonderful Life. and Oh, it's great. That they're giving people that big screen experience, as I explained previously. I found it different, I think. I think I did get something out of the film by watching it again in the cinema. Although it wasn't what I thought. I mean, to me, to be honest, it, watching it now on the big screen, it looks... 
It looks more childlike. I must admit. It's more childlike and more more ill orientated to children. I mean, it's, it feels different now than when I watched it 40 years ago, aged whatever I was. Funny enough, there were some little kids in the row in front of me, actually. Some kids are about uh, 10 or 11 sitting in front of me. I was younger than them when I saw when I saw it the first time. And I remember just thinking, you know, um, there's something simplistic about it. I, I can't help feeling that way. There's something... Maybe it's because I'm so familiar with it. Or maybe because I'm now seeing it as an adult, but... This is not... This is even, like I said, the, the romance between Han and Leia is not done very well, I must admit. It's, it's rather clichéd. It is a children's film, I think. Even though it's, it's something an adult... And there's some concepts, actually, that I think a, a child couldn't understand. I mean, a lot of it, like the... It's a family movie, I think. The, I think the, the true meaning behind Yoda's training of Luke... I wouldn't have... I didn't understand that when I first saw it. I said, I really... It's only when I read... The, when I was old enough to read Carlos Castaneda, I think I understood it. <clears throat> so, all in all... I'm glad I went to see it again. I did... I'm glad I went to see it again, but... It's... There's something missing from it. Something missing. That it was there when, the first time. It's not there now. I don't know what it is. I felt the same way, actually, when I watched A New Hope um, at Christmas. I, I don't think it's the films that have changed. I think it's me. I'm, I've changed. That's why. They're great movies, but... I, I, feel, that I feel different about them than I used to. Anyway, let's see what the critics have to say. There are actually numerous reviews for... Empire Strikes Back from modern reviewers after the 40 year time period and I won't go into them actually because they tend to focus on things such as how it's like a big soap opera, how it's not as good as the first one, it doesn't have the humour, the special effects aren't as good and things like that um, but uh, this is of course I, I have to do The Guardian don't I because well I've got to do The Guardian voice haven't I? My uh, movie roving reviews wouldn't be the same without my guardian voice and yes I like this i like this limit here support the guardian you must be bloody joking funded by readers i wouldn't give you a penny you bastards anyway <laughs> <coughs> the empire strikes back at 40 did the star wars saga peak too early oh damn me it didn't do a good enough job beating the white capitalist male patriarchy man oh well, um, well, to begin with the word peak, peak in, I think it probably peaked around about the end of it, Return of the Jedi. But anyway, <coughs> what does the Guardian have to say about it? A thrilling sequel opened up the Star Wars universe back in the 90, in 1980, for better or worse, with many underwhelming chapters then following. Well, that's true, I suppose. Uh, although, Return of the Jedi, I possibly consider one of the best I mean definitely it's brilliant but yeah I mean what happened came after that is best not talked about well when the Empire Strikes Back was released 40 years ago it was simply the sequel to Star Wars it was not yet Star Wars episode 5 the Empire Strikes Back the middle film middle chapter of a nine film saga told in three trilogies it was not yet subject to the obsessive tweaking that George Lucas started to do with the special editions two decades later. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I've already covered that, um, about the, the tweaking, the fiddling, as I call it. I mean, as I said, some of it is justified. The, the windows in the Cloud City, that was probably a good idea, actually, yeah. But, um, but anyway, um, it's... Generally speaking, like I said, that was a bad idea, and I, I think I do share the opinion of this this person, definitely. If that's a bad thing. And it was not yet freighted by spin-off projects, a splintered fan culture, and a mythology that's complicated by the incompatible, sometimes contradictory visions of multiple filmmakers and a corporate parent fussing over its investment. Oh. I, I don't know about that. I mean, I'm not into Star Wars fan culture, but there have been, like, numerous people input into Star Wars. And, of course, you can see 
I don't know if they mean by the incompatible and contradictory visions the same as as I do in terms of well I've already covered you know the I've covered the issue to do with political correctness I don't know if that's what they mean because they're supposed to they're the guardian they're supposed to be in favor of that <laughs> anyway watching the Empire Strikes Back in 2020 isn't exactly the same as watching it in 1980 that's true I mean I I've already explained I mean the the experience is totally different and it may be because I'm just very familiar with the film it's it could be just because I I've watched it so many times and it's been a part of my life that I it's maybe become blunted and sort of attenuated with familiarity and that's maybe why I said it was simplistic and it was you know wasn't what it used to be I don't know maybe I'm desensitized to it you know um the f the first trilogy okay yeah though not as aggressive as the other two in the first trilogy I was talking about the yeah the I see right I mean, see what I mean yeah has officially supplanted the original film and has a much glossier texture than the other films at that time than other films that time I suppose it does yeah um, yet it nonetheless feels so simple and pure and liberating not least because the future of the whole unwieldy franchise can be forgotten for 127 minutes and the past is only the 1977 Star Wars which here serves as the first act that does all the heavy lifting for the second that only has to step on the gas. That's a very perceptive way of looking at it, actually, and I have to agree. It's There's something about it which, of course, I suppose seen through, maybe just because of the fact I've grown so much older, but also because I've seen all the others. I've seen the prequels, I've seen the new trilogy, that it is a new experience it's different looking back on it now yeah well the first Star Wars was made as if there would never be another I don't know I honestly don't know actually when they came up with the idea of a sequel or whether there would be a sequel I know that there was a script written for a, a dozen or so films I know there's episode 4 there was a, a script written for a first one called the Journal of the Wills I know that because um, it's referred to in Alan Dean Foster's novelizations. Uh, Princess Leia is in it. I mean, but um, that was original. That was good. The original, the original name of the um, the first. But of course, what happened was that the that Princess Leia was actually born at the end of the first trilogy, along with Luke. So obviously, the the, the actual prequels were not the based on the original scripts written or the original storylines concocted, the original storyboards. Um, I should point out that Alan Dean Foster did write some Star Wars themed novels that were never filmed. I mean, there's a, there's a, the Star Wars universe has spun out into a whole load of other medias that have never seen celluloid. There's a book called The Splinter in the Mind's Eye, which is set in the Star Wars universe, has the, the characters we're all familiar with, but it's a completely different story. It's very good, actually, Splinter in the Mind's Eye. Um, but the Empire Strikes Back was made with the next film in mind. Yes, you can you can actually see. Now, I suppose the first Star Wars film does sort of like terminate. There's like a closure. There's no open ends on the first Star Wars movie. As far as you're concerned, when the Death Star's destroyed, the Empire is over. But um, the, Return of the, Je the Return of the Jedi is definitely waiting in the wings of the Empire Strikes Back. You actually hear, you know... You hear them all going, we're going to go off to Tatooine and tackle Jabba the Hutt. Get his hand back. You know, their, their whole mission now is now to redeem Han Solo from his cl from the clutches of Bob of, of Jabba the Hutt. Boba Fett's just run off with him. It's a narrative with no beginning and no end, starting with the assumption that the audience will know the characters and the events that preceded it, and then further assuming the audience will be comfortable without a conclusion. Um... Yes, I mean, of course I made that point as well. I mean, that's the middle part of a trilogy. And as I said, it's more open begun and more open-ended than Roswell Revealed, for example. Lucas himself had a good handle on serialisation, Raiders of the Lost Ark, which he would produce a year later, was inspired by old adventure, seri adventure serials. I suppose it was. I mean, Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Indiana Jones, the first Indiana Jones movie. It's actually, uh, who directed that? I think it was Spielberg. I mean, it was very good. 
Um, it is rather like the old um, stories such as the King Solomon's Mines, you know, Alan Quatermain and those stories, which are really... I think it's Ted Ryder Haggard who wrote those. They're bloody good. She, as well, is another really good one. Um, so it has that element to it, but I don't. I didn't detect there was any talk of a, a sequel to Raiders. Indeed, there was a prequel, wasn't there? Um, the Temple of Doom. Um, but many critics at the time were flummoxed, like the New York Times' Vincent Canby, who likened the film to reading the middle of a comic book. Well, duh. It's, I think the point is that you, they do expect you to know what's happened. They do expect you to have seen the first one, yeah. That's the, that's the whole point. It's a serial. It's, it's a serial of films. I mean, is, is, is that a criticism? What's wrong with that? Now that such serialization has become common, it's easier to appreciate how Lucas and his collaborators, the director Irving Kirshner and screenwriters Lee Brackett and Lawrence Kasdan, seized on the advantages of opening in the media's res and closing on a cliffhanger. And not just any cliffhanger, but an actual setback with key players of the Red Bull Alliance separated and Luke Skywalker having lost a duel with Darth Vader. Yeah. All that throat clearing necessity is to scroll informing us that Imperial troops are chasing rebel forces across the galaxy and that Luke and the freedom fighters are hiding yeah, out on it one half. Yeah, then it just gives like a kind of um, it could it gives you like a, a, a basically a, a slight as a uh, what's the word a summary a pre synopsis of the whole thing. Mm. Um, it talks about, I'm not going to read all this, it talks about Jaws, um, which is um, was sort of, again, a contemporary type, um, it's a contemporary type uh, f sort of blockbuster, isn't it? Yeah, and it talks about the hearth and the fetid swamplands of Dagobah. Um, it's the art, art deco sheen of Cloud City, yeah, that was good, wasn't it? It was very art deco, and um, funnily enough, there's no... Um, Hmm. There doesn't seem to be any reference, any sort of like cultural Marxist reference to Billy D. Williams and Lando Calrissian. That's unusual for the Guardian. It hasn't got there yet. It is very, very strange. But um, I don't know. It's, it's. I suppose they don't really reference what I think is the highlight of the whole thing, which I think what makes that movie is the arrival of Yoda is the very important scene where Luke does his training with Yoda and what happens there on Dagobah. That to me is the film. That's the whole thing. Anyway, after the Empire Strikes Back, the Star Wars saga would surrender to the ungainly and sentimental return of the Jedi and never quite find its way back to a film that's a simultaneously streamlined and complex. I don't think it's fair to call Return of the Jedi that, actually. Maybe I'll cover Return of the Jedi, because it'll probably be a fourth anniversary of that soon. A 40th anniversary of that soon. The operatic qualities of The Last Jedi came closest... Oh, the, no, I've already covered that one, haven't I? But then, the series had taken on so much weight from its patched-together mythology and accumulation of old and new characters that it couldn't move at the same speed. It's an all-killer, no-filler Star Wars movie. A steady escalation of action that's already in progress from the moment it starts. The series would never and can never be this good again. You know what? I actually find myself quite agreeing with The Guardian on this. It doesn't often happen, but... Uh, this critic is actually uh, quite correct, actually. It's Scott Tobias. He's actually made some good points here. I don't agree with everything he said. But he has actually, I think... Uh, given quite a perceptive view on this but again they I don't think they really understand it I mean I don't think I really understood it perhaps until I'd read Carlos Castaneda but it's the the thing with Yoda the introduction of Yoda and Yoda's role is absolutely crucial to the entire story without that the whole franchise would fall apart well, so that was my um a Panwo TV roving review of Star Wars Episode 5. 
the Empire Strikes Back. It's great to be doing these again. <coughs> I've been, I've, I think doing these roving reviews has been something I've really missed with the lockdown. I really have. And as imperfect the new system, system is with the wearing of masks and things like that, at least the cinemas are open. At least they're out and about. You can get out there and see them. It's, uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, I tell you, because I've, I've enjoyed making this. I really have. Plenty more planned. As I said, there's the Matrix, uh, the Matrix um, 20th anniversary. Let's go and see that. And I've got all the videos planned as well. And uh, one final thing. Yeah, before any of you ask, yes, I am going to go and see Tesla. Thank you for watching Hapanwo TV. Hospital Port is pride and dignity. Stop the new world order.